Welcome. My name is Professor Judith McNamara and I'm the Dean of Law at the University of Adelaide. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge the land we meet on today is the traditional land of the Ghana people and pay my respect to the spiritual relationship of the Ghana people with their country and recognise that their cultural and heritage beliefs are as important to the living Ghana people today as they have always been. Our law school has a distinguished tradition of excellence in international law, but it is equally vital to acknowledge our long-standing commitment to Aboriginal people and the law. The University of Adelaide's Law School has been dedicated to promoting justice and equity for Indigenous communities. We are proud to affirm our commitment to supporting the Uluru Statement from the heart and the enshrinement in the Constitution of an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice to Parliament. It is our responsibility as scholars and practitioners of law to stand in solidarity with this essential step towards reconciliation and meaningful Indigenous representation in our nation's governance. On behalf of the Adelaide Law School, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to the prestigious James Crawford Oration. I would like to, like to take a moment to acknowledge our distinguished guests. First and foremost, we are deeply honoured to have with us members of the Crawford family who honour us with their connection to the legacy of Professor James Crawford. In particular, it is a pleasure to welcome Michael Crawford, James's older brother. I also acknowledge the Chancellor of the University of Adelaide, the Honourable Catherine Branson, ACKC, and the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Business, Law and Economics, Professor John Williams, um, and also Mr Joshua Teague, MP, Shadow Attorney General and Member for Hyson. And I'm welcoming all of those who are in the room and also those who are, um, have logged into our webinar, webinar online. And I'm really pleased to note that we've had over 170 uh, registrations for this evening's event. So I hope that there are many of you listening in online and that that is all working well for you. The James Crawford Oration is a biennial lecture series in international law, which was inaugurated in 2003. This lecture is the ninth in the series and is taking place as we celebrate the 140th year of the Adelaide Law School. Today, we have the distinct pleasure of welcoming to, deli to deliver the oration a remarkable individual who has made significant contributions to the field of international law, Ambassador Dr. Beth Van Skak. The James Crawford Oration honours one of our most distinguished graduates, Professor James Crawford. <coughs> Professor Crawford had a most distinguished career in international law. We are extremely proud that he was an alumnus of the Adelaide Law School. He graduated with the Bachelor of Laws Honours in 1972, and then in 1974, he was appointed to the academic staff of the school. He held a personal chair from 1983 to 1986, and thereafter took up a position at the Sydney Law School. Professor Crawford was the Huell Professor of International Law and Director of the uh, Law to Pact Centre of International Law at Cambridge University. Professor Crawford authored a considerable body of highly respected and influential scholarly work and was one of the most outstanding international legal advocates of our age. Although too numerous to mention all of his considerable, considerable achievements, some of the highlights include his membership of the United Nations International Law Commission between 1992 and 2001, his appointment as Special Rapporteur on a State Responsibility from 1997 to 2001, and his service as a judge of the International Court of Justice from 2015 to 2021. Today, I am delighted to introduce Ambassador Dr. Beth Van Skak as our esteemed speaker. Throughout her career, Ambassador Van Skak has worked tirelessly to address critical issues such as international criminal law, transitional justice, and the protection of vulnerable uh, populations in conflict zones. Her expertise has shaped academic discourse and policy in the realm of international law. Ambassador Van Skak was bought, sworn in as the Department of State's sixth ambassador at large for global criminal justice in March of 2022. In this role, she advises the Secretary of State and other department leadership on issues related to the prevention of and the response to atrocity crimes, including war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Prior to returning to public service in 2022, Ambassador Van Skak was the Leah Kaplan Visiting Professor in Human Rights at the Stanford Law School where she taught international criminal law, human rights, human trafficking, and a policy lab on legal and policy tools for pre preventing atrocities. In addition, she directed Stanford's International Human Rights and Conflict Resolution Clinic. 
As we look forward to Ambassador Van Skak's oration today, we anticipate an engaging and insightful exploration of pressing issues in international law. She will, she will be addressing the contemporary state of international criminal law and the pathways open to the international community to cooperatively bolster the effectiveness of this law. Her perspective, honed through years of experience, promises to inspire us all to think critically and responsibly in our roles as global citizens. We are truly honoured to have her as a distinguished speaker for this year's James Crawford Oration. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ambassador Van Skag. Thank you so much, Jean, and thank you for everyone who organized this event this evening. I'm really pleased to be here in Australia, and it's a, a true honor to deliver the Crawford Oration. I knew Professor Crawford in the way that all aspirants know the giants in their field. There were periods of my career when I consulted his magisterial annotation of the draft articles of state responsibility, I think literally on a daily basis. And in my current world, he's most remembered for drafting the first version of a, a statute for a permanent international criminal court when he was on the International Law Commission. The world is very much a diminished place with his passing, and I will treasure the opportunity that I had this afternoon to meet some members of his family here at the university. And as many of you know, although he made profound contributions as a jurist, as a scholar, and as a practitioner of international law, no doubt he would feel that his most um, real and, and um, uh, beloved legacy was the many students whom he inspired over the course of his career. And so it's fitting that we're here at the University of Adelaide celebrating him and all of his contributions to the field that I love and I know many of you do as well. So I am here in Australia meeting with students, with non-governmental organizations, and which my, with my counterparts in government to discuss how we can work together to strengthen the system of international justice, given what we are now experiencing in terms of headwinds, um, in addition when it comes to emergent authoritarianism and an international armed conflict in Europe. As mentioned in the introduction, my office advises the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, and other senior members of the interagency within the United States government on the prevention of and responses to atrocity crimes around the world. We do this through a whole of government approach, but also through building bilateral and multilateral partnerships and engagement. And my office deploys a small programming budget in order to capacitate this work. Uh, I'm an ambassador at large, which is to say I have a functional portfolio, not a country for portfolio, and so my remit is technically global. Um, as such, my team and I tend to work at various points along, if you can imagine, a, a, an arc of an atrocity situation. So when um, the situation is a situation at risk, where we are seeing risk factors of atrocities, we're working upstream with our human rights and our development colleagues in order to think creatively about what sort of preventive measures can be taken in order to um, elevate peacemakers, in order to build resiliency within societies, in order to address long standing grievances so they don't explode into communal or organized violence. If we're in a situation in which atrocities are underway, um, we're in a mitigation posture, thinking about what legal, financial, diplomatic, and other tools we have in order to try and diminish the violence that's happening, or at a minimum, to initiate credible documentation projects so we understand what's happening and we can prepare for future accountability. After the fact, we work to foster justice broadly defined. This includes advising embassies and posts, foreign governments, non-governmental organizations on deploying the whole range of transitional justice mechanisms devoted to truth telling, to reparation, to reconciliation, to memorialization, and ultimately to guarantees of non-repetition. So as you can imagine, this was a big job uh, in February 2022, and it became literally a crushing job on February 24th, 2023, after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. I thought I would take this opportunity this evening to discuss multiple pathways to justice that we are traversing um, with, with my, my team, my government, multilateral partners, non-governmental partners, civil society actors, and others around the world trying to promote justice for the war crimes and other atrocities that we're seeing on a daily basis in Ukraine. I hope that this will give us a snapshot of the possibilities around justice for Ukraine, but also 
bear upon the state of international justice, the system of international justice today, that might have reverberations and ramifications for other situations that cry out for justice. Although much of my time is, is focused on the situation in Ukraine, I take my title of being the ambassador at large for global criminal justice very seriously. And I've traveled the world to Liberia, Gambia, Ethiopia, Colombia, Bangladesh, all places that cry out for justice. Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine has been marked by war crimes, crimes against humanity, and other atrocities literally everywhere that Russia's troops have been deployed. We've seen attacks on civilian infrastructure, including on energy facilities in the midst of a bitter winter cold, calculated for maximum impact. We've seen harm to civilians and POWs in custody, in a network of detention and torture centers in areas under Russia's occupation and control. We've seen conflict-related sexual violence against women and girls, but also against men and boys. We've seen the establishment of a system of filtration where individuals in areas under Russia's control are subjected to essentially a vetting process whereby if they're deemed sufficiently trustworthy, they're allowed to continue their, about their days. If not, they may be taken into custody or even disappeared. And a particularly depraved element of Russia's approach in, in Ukraine has been the abduction, detention, and retention of ch Ukrainian children, some of whom were sent abroad for their safety, never to, be, to have their relationships with their families and guardians severed, never to be heard from again. Others have been literally captured from their homes and taken often to far-flung places within Russia. This is now, of course, the subject of an international criminal court investigation. So if we think about the pathways that exist for justice, we can imagine four in particular, and I often describe it as five um, when I speak to an American audience, so I'll adapt it slightly for this audience. Um, first, of course, are Ukrainian courts. These courts are open. Investigators and prosecutors are, as we speak, even as the missiles rain down, even as the air raid sirens are firing, they are out there in the field documenting, investigating, collecting evidence, and levying charges against individuals deemed responsible for the war crimes and other atrocities that we are seeing. The Office of the Prosecutor General has recorded over 100,000 incidents that may constitute prosecutable crimes. How this would be a daunting task for any, even the most well-resourced prosecutorial office. Imagine an office that has never had to confront prosecuting war crimes in the past. So this is a daunting task. My office was funding, dating back to the original war in, in 2014, a very small project, surging expertise individuals who are the veterans of the world's war crimes tribunals to Ukraine in order to work side by side with their counterparts to help those intrepid investigators and prosecutors evaluate the evidence, sift through the various charges that might be brought, consider the chain of command, the order of battle, what charges might exist under international law and within their own domestic penal code, and just support them in their efforts to bring some measure of justice to the Ukrainian people. So that project started in about 2019. We had to dramatically scale that effort after Russia's full-scale invasion. And we have now joined with the United Kingdom and the European Union to form the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group. This is essentially a donor coordination mechanism to ensure that as these states are supporting efforts of justice in Ukraine, we are coordinating amongst our implementing partners. We are not over-investing in some areas and under-investing in other areas. The United States has now formed a multinational fund, and we are inviting other states to join. Part of the reason I'm here in Australia is to meet with my counterparts in Canberra in order to encourage Australia to join the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group and to bring the expertise that they have developed um, internally within their own system, but also with the legions of terrific Australian international criminal lawyers that are now working all over the world in various justice institutions. Bring that expertise to bear to assist now our new colleagues in Ukraine as they confront this incredibly daunting exercise. Our Department of Justice is also engaged in capacity building and partnering with their counterparts. We've had a number of field study visits involving witness and, and victim protection issues, involving environmental crimes, all of the, the sort of new cutting edge areas that will have to be explored and examined and implemented in this effort at domestic justice. 
So that's pathway number one. Pathway number two involves international institutions. The international community moved incredibly quickly after the full-scale invasion in order to launch a number of documentation efforts. This includes a commission of inquiry out of the Human Rights Council in Geneva. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe has deployed its so-called Moscow mechanism. It's sort of a coincidence that it happens to be called. The Moscow mechanism it turns out to be quite, press, quite prescient. Um, this is a rapid reaction investigative team um, me mechanism that can be deployed to explore an OSCE member states if they're falling short of their commitments around human rights. Three Moscow mechanism um, uh, operations have been deployed now with respect to Russia, one with respect to Belarus, and one with respect to Russia internal to Russia human rights issues within their own borders and with respect to their own citizens. These entities joined a human rights monitoring mission that had already been in place within Ukraine, again through the auspices of the United Nations. And so all of these international bodies are out there collecting, documenting potential evidence of war crimes. In addition, we have legions of civil society organizations, some working very much in the grassroots, others working internationally but in partnership with local organizations, all utilizing new incredible techniques of open source investigations and evaluation. Ukraine, I think it's fair to say, is probably now the most documented crime base in human history. In this respect, I think it has surpassed Syria. The penetration of cell phones, the ability to capture digital artifacts of war crimes and other atrocities is of a likes that we've never seen. And so we're moving from a situation then where, where I started my career in international criminal justice at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. We were desperate for documentation. Now we have reams of documentation, and the challenge is really finding a needle in a stack of digital needles. Um, these organizations are training their local counterparts in order to do this work, given the modern nature of how evidence is being produced. Uh, at the International Criminal Court, an unprecedented uh, referral by 43 states parties has enabled the prosecutor to immediately open an investigation. Ukraine had accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC going back to 2013, and so there's quite an open-ended temporal jurisdiction before the court now. Um, to be sure that Ukraine has not fully ratified the statute, but they have, um, Im they have implemented a, an ad hoc declaration that accepts jurisdiction. The Office of the Prosecutor has made their first move, seeking arrest warrants against President Putin himself and his Children's Rights Commissioner, Maria Lvova Belova, for the transfer and deportation of civilians, namely children, from um, Russia-controlled and occupied territory into Russia proper. As many of the law students in the room will know, this is a grave breach of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which protects civilians. This investigation is ongoing, and we are anticipating additional arrest warrant um, petitions. The United States, amongst a number of other states, are looking for ways to support the International Criminal Court in this investigation going forward. Ukraine has also been quite brilliant in utilizing lawfare um, in terms to seeking to advance its legal claims against Russia in literally every jurisdiction that it might be able to do so. So before the International Court of Justice, there are cases under the Convention on the Elimination of, the, of Racial Discrimination and the Convention on Terrorist Financing dating from prior to Russia's full-scale invasion. And now since then, there are claims under the Genocide Convention that were just subject to hearings now before the ICJ. Um, Professor Crawford, as a longtime practitioner before the International Criminal Court and of, or International Court of Justice, and of course a judge on that court, would be incredibly proud, I think, to see the way in which Ukraine has turned to international law and turned to international institutions in order to establish and defend norms that we hold dear, even with respect to a perennial scoff law like Russia. So, second pathway to justice, international institutions, with the ICC being central, but these other institutions as well um, adjudicating international law claims. The third pathway to justice involves third states that might be in a position to exercise jurisdiction over perpetrators of war crimes and other atrocities. These cases will proceed under extraterritorial principles of jurisdiction, such as universal jurisdiction, in the event that perpetrators might fall within the personal jurisdiction or the jurisdictional reach of these courts. We have seen this with respect to the conflict in Syria, where dozens of cases have moved forward in mostly European courts because Syrian perpetrators Perpetrators have eventually left the, the, the country, often under a, an assumed name or hiding in refugee flows. They are eventually seen at the local Arab market. Diaspora communities, immigrant communities have developed 
trusting relationships with law enforcement. They recognize someone. They call law enforcement. Law enforcement can open an investigation, verify the identity of the person and the allegations against them, and then launch cases against them. This incredible revitalization of the principle of universal jurisdiction has really revolutionized the field of international criminal justice and made good on the promise that the first line of defense should always be national courts. Yes, there should be international courts. There's always a role for international courts, but internet, but national courts need to step up and take the um, undertake this responsibility for delivering justice for the commission of international crimes. This whole phenomenon has been really facilitated by international and, not, and national non-governmental organizations, groups that are doing investigations themselves to a criminal law standard, groups that are working with victims and survivors in order to prepare testimony and to accompany them during a justice process so that they have a meaningful experience with justice, working side by side with national authorities. So very interesting public-private partnerships have enabled these cases to be successful in European courts. And I have no doubt that that, that pattern and that trend will continue when it comes to Ukraine. Those perpetrators will eventually travel, either because they are tossed out or because they decide it's safer to face justice abroad than the alternative that they might be facing internal to Russia, or they want to go shopping, or their kids are in school somewhere. And maybe even years later, they will be identified and the world's prosecutors and investigators will be ready. We have seen increasingly interoperability between the war crimes units of national courts, particularly within Europe under the Eurojust network. These specialized war crimes units are um, gaining confidence in bringing these cases, inspiring each other, sharing techniques, sharing evidence. A joint investigative team has now formed between some of the frontline states around Ukraine and the International Criminal Court. This enables conversations cop to cop, essentially, without having to go through the more cumbersome diplomatic mutual legal assistance process where you have to go to a court, ask for assistance, go up to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, go across to the next Ministry of Foreign Affairs and then down to a local court. Now we can have practitioners talking to each other through this JIT, this joint investigative team, under the, the rubric of the Eurojust um, network within Europe. There, in addition, um, I know that there is a, somewhat of a debate happening here in Australia as to whether Australia should form a dedicated war crimes unit to be able to develop that sort of in-house expertise to utilize your suite of international crimes in your own penal code and also to be a part of this burgeoning community of international criminal law practitioners working within their national domestic system. The fourth pathway to justice involves the crime of aggression. This is a crime that has not been prosecuted since the World War II period. Indeed, Nuremberg was meant to be the, 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 the trial to end all war. Unfortunately, that did not happen. Nonetheless, the concept of crimes against the peace was developed at Nuremberg, but then essentially went into quiescence when it comes to international criminal law. Ukraine, however, has insisted that this is essentially the originator crime, the crime that happened first, that then opened the door to all the other international crimes that we're seeing committed on Ukrainian territory. And so they have insisted that the international community think about how to prosecute the crime of aggression. They have formed what's called a core, the core group. This group meets monthly in order to explore the modalities for how this can be done, digging back into the precedent from World War II and modernizing that to the present. At the current moment, there are sort of competing models being considered. One would involve the General Assembly creating a standalone institution. The Security Council would normally undertake this role and in fact created the two ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda at the renaissance of the field of international criminal justice in the 1990s. Of course, the Security Council is foreclosed by virtue of the fact that Russia will predictably exercise its veto with respect to any measure um, along these lines in terms of creating a justice institution, which has given rise to um, impulses to turn to the General Assembly. The second model that's under consideration is an internationalized court, a hybrid court, if you will, that would be embedded within the Ukrainian judicial system, but that would benefit from significant international investment. This would include information sharing, funding, the secondment of personnel, diplomatic support, etc. It could be located outside of Ukraine and then moved back to Kyiv when the security conditions would allow. Um, this is a model that has been used quite effectively in other situation countries in order to both build capacity within the national system, but also ensure international expertise, etc., is infused within those proceedings. 
at present, Ukraine has preferred the UNGA model, and they do this for two reasons. One, they want this proceeding to be internationalized. They want to have the gravitas of the full international community involved. They, they see the war in Ukraine as not just about a breach of Ukrainian sovereignty, but about a breach of those norms within the UN Charter that we all hold dear, the right to territorial integrity, the right to political independence. And so they see the General Assembly as a, 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 a way to uh, internationalize this effort. They also want to overcome head of state immunity on the part of Putin and the, the so-called Troika, the top three executive officials that would benefit from head of state immunity were they to be prosecuted in a national court. The United States favors the internationalized model, and we do this for two reasons. One is because we're concerned about legal impediments within the General Assembly to create an institution with coercive powers. Under the UN Charter system, the General Assembly is only empowered to make recommendations to states. It cannot exercise executive power. That is reserved, right or wrong, to the Security Council under the UN Charter system. So that's the legal concern about the General Assembly model. The practical concern is a question of whether or not the votes exist within the General Assembly to create a big, new, dedicated, expensive justice institution. If you track the voting records within the General Assembly since the war began, when the resolution is a broad condemnatory resolution calling for accountability, condemning Russia's actions, these resolutions garner about 140 votes. The minute you ask the General Assembly to actually do something, such as kick Russia off the Human Rights Council or create a register of damage for Ukrainian citizens to register financial harm occasioned by Russia's war of aggression, the positive votes drop down to 90. And the concern is that we won't reach a majority to be able to establish a court. And what message would that send? So the United States in these debates has favored more of an internationalized tribunal. And in this, we're joined with our G7 partners as well. These negotiations continue, and we are looking for common ground and ways to bridge the divide between the two, um, the two different proposals. In the meantime, we're not sitting idle. The international community has created an international center for the prosecution of aggression sitting in The Hague, which of course is the international capital of justice. This center is essentially a proto-prosecutorial office. The United States has relocated one of our seasoned prosecutors to The Hague to assist with this effort. The idea is to explore how one would prosecute the crime of aggression under modern international law and to prepare all of the analysis, et cetera, that will be necessary for this future tribunal to be able to effectively exercise jurisdiction. So that's pathway number four, reviving the concept of the crime of aggression. And I should note at the outset that the reason we have to look at the, a potentially new institution is that the ICC, although it has the power to exercise jurisdiction over aggression, cannot do so in this instance because neither Ukraine nor Russia has ratified the Rome Statute. So pathway number five um, is generally the pathway that leads to our own national system. So I'll discuss a little bit about the US system, but you can imagine how this could be translated to be thinking about what Australia's obligations and the possibilities here for justice with respect to this terrible war. In the United States, we do have a suite of international crimes within our national penal code. Historically, this has involved genocide, war crimes, the use of child soldiers, torture, human trafficking, piracy, um, and a whole suite of terrorism type crimes. We do not have a crimes against humanity statute. And until the end of last year, our war crimes statute was quite limited. It only allowed for jurisdiction if the perpetrator or the victim was a US person. And so would not have been particularly useful in the Russian context if we're dealing with a Ukrainian victim and a Russian perpetrator. It might have been utilized in a case of a dual national or if a United States citizen was somehow harmed um, or caught up in the fight uh, in Ukraine, but otherwise it would not have been useful. As a result of these jurisdictional limitations, it's essentially been a dead letter within our federal penal code. Congress, inspired by the situation in Ukraine, has gone to revisit that statute, gone back and looked at our obligations under the 1949 Geneva Conventions and the grave breaches enforcement provisions within those treaties, which require states to prosecute war crimes regardless of the nationality of the, of the protagonists and regardless of where those crimes were committed. And so Congress has now brought our War Crimes Act into better compliance with our treaty obligations. So we now have a much more fulsome set of tools that can be used in the event that an individual comes within our jurisdictional reach. 
We still do require the presence of the accused within the United States in order to proceed. But that may, may or may not be an impediment. Um, according to our immigration authorities, we have five Russians crossing the southern border on a daily basis. And so investigations are underway to ensure that those individuals have not been associated with abuses. We have a dedicated war crimes unit within our own Department of Justice, the Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section, plus sister organizations within the Federal Bureau of Investigations and the Department of Homeland Security. Together, they have a fusion cell that focuses on bringing charges under either the substantive crimes within our federal penal code, or if those are unavailable for whatever reason, crime you know, statute of limitation, for example, or ex post facto concerns, we also can utilize immigration remedies. If the individual came into the United States and made a certification on a visa application that he or she did not participate in the persecution of others, if that box is checked no, and evidence emerged that in fact that individual did participate in harm to others, that is a federal offense and can be prosecuted as such within federal law and also can be the subject of immigration remedies. So this fusion cell is um, charged with determining the best way to handle the presence of individuals who stand accused of committing war crimes within our own national system. Um, Attorney General Merrick Garland also created a dedicated team within the Human Rights and Special Prosecutions Unit, the War Crimes Accountability Team, War Cat, because every cool team needs a cool name. Um, and the War Cat is now looking at cases that might be able to be prosecuted under US law. So in closing, I want to note that, as President Zelensky has said so aptly, that there can be no peace without justice in Ukraine, justice for the millions who have had their lives disrupted and destroyed as a result of this senseless, unprovoked, and illegal war of territorial conquest. Holding Russia to account for its war crimes and other atrocities within Ukraine and against its peace people is incredibly important, because other states are, of course, watching how the international community has reacted. And if the law stands silent, there will be states that will be emboldened by Russia's actions. Now, all that said, and the, the situation in Ukraine is incredibly important, I want to close with acknowledging and emphasizing how important justice issues are elsewhere around the world. There have been grumbling within other parts of the world that the international community only cares about what's happening in northern states, only cares about what's happening in Europe, and doesn't care about what's happening around the world. So there are grumbling about selective justice and about um, entrenched impunity in other parts of the world. So I'm taking on, as part of my job, a goal of ensuring that I'm continuing to push for efforts of justice around the world. So a couple of places I'll mention, I would be very happy to take questions about these. The Rohingya in Myanmar, almost upwards of a million individuals are now sitting in neighboring Bangladesh, um, basically thrown out, chased out of their country as their villages burned behind them at the hands of the Tatmadaw military. There are multiple pathways to justice for Rohingya. The International Criminal Court has been seized. Myanmar is not a party, but Bangladesh is. And part of the crimes were committed on the territory of Bangladesh, including forcible deportation of the civilian population. The International Court of Justice has been seized. The Gambia, a tiny state within West Africa, has exercised its rights under the Genocide Convention to accuse Myanmar of committing genocide against Rohingya individuals and communities. That case is now proceeding before the International Court of Justice, again, Professor Crawford would be proud to see his court so central in trying to resolve the, the imperative of justice for the people, the Rohingya people. There's also cases under universal jurisdiction. I traveled down to Argentina, which has opened an investigation against the Tatmadaw military. My office helped to facilitate with its funding and its NGO partners the travel of seven survivors from a refugee camp in Bangladesh down to Buenos Aires to give live testimony before a court. It's one of the first times that has happened, that individuals have been able to testify about what they experience, and then get them back into a refugee camp in a country that is overwhelmed by the Rohingya refugee exodus. This is all without a Bangladesh embassy in Argentina. So we had to work through the embassy within Brazil. So an incredible feat organized by non-governmental organizations to give those seven individuals, but everyone else who knows that that happened, a window, a, a, a glimmer of justice here. There's many other places around the world that similarly cry out for justice, and I'd be very happy to discuss them with you um, in, in closing. So we're doing what we can on the tough cases, um, and I'm very pleased to share some of the insights into our work in the, as the Office of Global Criminal Justice and the state of international justice going forward, and I look forward to the ensuing conversation. Thank you.
Thank you, Ambassador. I'd like to invite Professor Dale Stevens to provide a commentary. Uh, Professor Stevens will be well known to many of you in the Adelaide Law School community. He is the Director of the Research Unit on Military Law and Ethics. Uh, he is passionate about international law. Uh, he was a student of Professor Crawford, um, in fact, um, and um, no doubt inspired by him. Uh, he teaches international law to our undergraduate students. He teaches international and military law uh, to our postgrad students, um, and he makes an outstanding contribution to the intellectual life of the law school. Welcome, Dale. Thank you, Judith. Uh, thank you, Beth, for a superb presentation, uh, one that impressively joins the great tradition of speakers and topics in this series. I've been asked to provide a short commentary uh, onto this uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, I've undertaken to Matthew not to talk about space or the Woomera Manual, although it is the Woomera Manual is coming out uh, in early 2024 by OUP. Beth did contribute to the Woomera Manual, so there's my uh, legitimacy for talking about that. The presentation was extremely thought-provoking and speaks to ways in which the international criminal law uh, project can be rendered relevant and effective, especially against the challenge of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and flagrant violation of international law. I'd like to respond uh, to each of those uh, pathways and then offer my own thoughts uh, about how this event is otherwise uh, shaping international law. So pathway uh, one, uh, international courts, the ICC. The evidence um, is overwhelming of international uh, support for the exercise of ICC jurisdiction. Uh, 42 state uh, referrals to the ICC regarding uh, Russia and Ukraine, including that of Australia, uh, dealing with war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. In March this year, warrants were issued for the arrest of Putin uh, and the other uh, uh, person for unlawful deportation of over 19,000 children. Is the arrest and subsequent prosecution of uh, Vladimir Putin likely? Probably not. Um, does this have any effect? Well, it certainly has legal effect, but it also has normative and political effect. It speaks to the close relationship between international law and international relations. It restricts uh, Russian diplomatic capacity. It provides an objective counter-narrative to Russian propaganda and misinformation. It may deter uh, Russian civilian cooperation. There are incentives being offered to Russian families to take uh, some of these children. Uh, it restricts uh, Putin's uh, movement. I noticed at the recent BRICS uh, summit in August 2023 in South Africa, uh, he beamed in via uh, Zoom or whatever mechanism he used rather than attend. Hence, while this eventual ICC prosecution is unlikely, it is clear that the world just got very, very smaller for Vladimir Putin. And these warrants, as Beth uh, has outlined, are enduring. The ICJ, Ukraine, filed uh, proceedings claiming Russian falsely alleged uh, genocide by Ukraine. Provisional orders uh, made by the ICJ in uh, March 2022, ordering Russian operations to cease. Well, plainly they haven't. Uh, but between July and December of uh, last year, 33 states uh, filed declarations of intervention, including Australia. Um, the orders are not complied with, but they may form the basis for reparations uh, after the conclusion uh, of the war. Uh, the transfer of ch uh, children by Russia, of course, is in itself an act of genocide under the Genocide Convention. So uh, that also will find uh, uh, prominence in the ICJ. These actions by the ICJ and the ICC attest to the strong legal support by numerous states uh, to the rule of law and adds to the normative power of international law, having both reputa reputational and dormant legal impact on Russia. Pathway number two, Beth spoke about Ukrainian uh, courts. The goal of the ICC statute, as she mentioned, is not to be the, uh, the clearinghouse of all international crime. The, the, the purpose of the ICC statute always was to have national courts uh, take the lead in prosecuting war crimes, crimes against humanity, etc. And Ukraine uh, has stepped up to this. Uh, Ukraine uh, convicted the first, its first uh, Russian defendant, 21-year-old Russian tank commander uh, who killed a civilian uh, in May 2022. Uh, As of May 2023, 31 uh, Russian uh, nationals were convicted in Ukrainian courts. This process, like that of the ICTY and the ICTR, is helping to shape uh, international criminal jurisprudence and will no doubt have an enduring effect on the shape of international criminal law uh, in years to come. 
Third state support has been very strong, and Australian nationals, uh, including some that I know from here in Adelaide, have been assisting uh, heavily in the investigative uh, process. Pathway number three, strategic uh, litigation in domestic courts, both direct and indirect. Directly, uh, there is uh, evidence of coordinated international efforts to share investigative results and evidence regarding uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine. And indirectly, national courts are dealing with economic and commercial implications arising uh, through the war. Relying upon third state national judicial systems to implement validly imposed sanctions and to inform meaning in involving areas of the law, such as that of qualified neutrality, which I'll speak to um, at the end. Pathway number four, prosecuting aggression. It's a big one, uh, as Beth outlined, uh, perhaps the most, most challenging pathway of all. The crime of aggression has a very high threshold uh, for prosecution under the ICC statute to, to be successful, and of course Russia is not a party, nor is Ukraine, to the ICC statute. I note Beth made comment about other uh, mechanisms by which to deal with aggression, uh, but the big one, the ICC statute, would appear to be a, a non-starter. But that doesn't mean that the issue of aggression has no effect, and I want to talk about that briefly uh, at the end, and I think uh, it's having a very clear impact on the development of other areas of law, and particularly international humanitarian law. Pathway five, uh, strengthen the law in the US, um, uh, with the US establishing a more robust crime against humanity and, uh, uh, and aligning uh, its law with that of partners and allies. Uh, thankfully, Australia is a party to the ICC statute, and we have in our Commonwealth criminal law under Division 268 crimes dealing with war, uh, war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, genocide, and of course the crime of aggression. So uh, we at least have our house in order in that regard. Let me turn now to this issue of qualified neutrality and what does this war mean in terms of legal developments that I think will have enduring impact. Of course, in the absence of a Security Council action, as we have heard, uh, the General Assembly can only make non-binding recommendations. But it's not without legal force, at least as a manifestation of state opinion uh, on this issue. As uh, Beth mentioned, uh, 141 votes uh, to five uh, by the General Assembly identifying Russia as the aggressor. Uh, ICJ order of the 16th of March similarly making that uh, conclusion leads uh, legitimacy to the classification of Russia as the aggressor and Ukraine as the victim. Our own uh, Foreign Minister Penny Wong, September 22, 2022, Russia has been and remains an aggressor illegally occupying parts of Ukrainian land. What does this mean for the law of neutrality? Traditionally, under the law of neutrality and, and the law of armed conflict, uh, you had a choice as a, as a third state not involved. You either supplied uh, nothing to either or you supplied uh, war materials to both. That was, in a very, very quick nutshell, um, what the law of neutrality required. The idea, though, that you would supply arms to an aggressor, a proclaimed aggressor, 141 to 5, uh, seems a very odd conclusion. It seems to suggest that the law of neutrality um, might have run its uh, course in this regard. And certainly a number of commentators uh, have made that uh, point. Uh, Professor Wolf Heinchel von Heinig uh, from Germany, <laughs> uh, with a name like that, uh, has made this point uh, very, very strongly that uh, we, the world can't stand by and um, live with the law of neutrality uh, where there is an identified aggressor. Uh, the law can't be that inflexible. And indeed, what we have seen is 33 states, including our own, uh, supplying uh, war material to Ukraine, the identified victim of the acts of aggression by Russia. Not all states accept this. Some states still insist on the classic uh, law regarding neutrality, but I think the law is changing. How do I get there? The ILC, 
the Articles of State Responsibility, the, the very articles that Professor Crawford perfected in five years after 50 years of attempts by others, uh, comes to the conclusion or, or makes a number of statements. There is an obligation under international law to cooperate to bring to an end through lawful means serious breaches of peremptory norms. Alternatively, no state shall recognise as lawful a situation created by a serious breach within the meaning of Article 40, nor render aid or assistance in maintaining that situation. An act of aggression is identified by the International Law Commission as a, uh, as just cogens, as a peremptory norm. So there is an obligation to not assist those states that are engaging in um, uh, violations of peremptory norms. Is the supply of arms a lawful countermeasure then? Well, under the Nicaragua case, and we know the Nicaragua case stands for many things, um, and indeed, as I've said to my first year students, if in doubt in the exam, cite the Nicaragua case, you'll probably be right. Um, but one of the things that it did say is that you can't use force uh, as a countermeasure. But the Nicaragua case dealt with its own facts. The Nicaragua case was dealing with rebels trying to overthrow a legitimate government, not one state being declared by 141 states in the United Nations General Assembly as being the aggressor. And subsequent state practice under the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, I think, conclusively uh, confirms that states providing uh, material aid to Ukraine to defend itself um, is, not, is not a violation of that prohibition. Indeed, uh, uh, Professor Pete Pedrozo of the US Naval War College notes, the imposition of sanctions and the provision of war-related materials, albeit violations of the law of neutrality, would be appropriate countermeasures to convince Russia to withdraw its forces. So I think in that regard, an allied cognate area that arises from this uh, characterization of these actions under international law is evolving. And so in conclusion, we have existing mechanisms regarding international criminal law and, and dealing with uh, affronts, brazen attacks uh, or to the international order. It is the usual case that such brazen acts do force to promote in, invigoration of the law, both substantive and procedural, and uh, I had the benefit of a, of a seminar, a short seminar that uh, Ambassador Van Schack uh, generously offered to, to provide our students, where she noted correctly, in my view, respectfully, that the ICTY and the ICTR did take international law forward in very, very meaningful ways. And I think this experience will do exactly the same with respect to international criminal law and, and international law more, bro more broadly. It is unlikely that we'll see a prosecution of Putin in the International Criminal Court, but that should not be the only measure of success. Rather, regard should be had to the normative and political impact of the multiple legal measures that are being steadily arrayed against him and his supporting regime. So the theme of this talk, Beth has skillfully and expertly invited us to explore the means of international cooperation to bolster and make more effective international criminal law. And we should take up that challenge with confidence because the time is right to perfect this valuable system of international accountability. I'm optimistic, I'm hopeful, because the law has patience and has stamina to outlast tyrants and will again do the same now. Thank you very much. Now we do have time for questions and the ambassador has indicated that she's open to questions. I think we have mics here. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, you said that the US State Department is using its full efforts to assist the Ukrainian government in prosecuting war crimes within its own court system as well as through all other methods. Mm -hmm. uh, to what extent has American intelligence assisted thus far in prosecution of specific war crimes already and in what circumstances do you think that US intelligence specifically like which Russian unit was where and when occupying an area when a certain offence occurred? Uh, to what extent do you think American intelligence support might be helpful to supporting Ukrainian prosecutorial efforts? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And I apologize that I can't really give you the specifics that I think you're super curious about for maybe reasons that are obvious. But you know what I can say is this, you will have seen with this particular administration um, at the, at the, in the run-up to Russia's full-scale invasion in February of last year, the declassification and release, public release of intelligence 
at a rate that we've never seen historically. There really is a recognition in our current office of the Director of National Intelligence that intelligence should be useful. It should serve a purpose. It's not something sort of precious, you know, that we admire in a closet somewhere, but that in fact it should be put to use. And so I think we are seeing that with respect to this war in Ukraine as well, both from the perspective of sharing with the world Russia's intentions as we become aware of them, but also in terms of documenting what we're seeing happening on the ground. Not with, you know, with respect to harm to individuals, but also responsible individuals who, who could be held, uh, held accountable for those acts. So we have various information sharing arrangements with our Ukrainian colleagues, for example, including mutual legal assistance treaties that we can use with respect to them, and then more informal relationships. And so these are all being explored and, and looking for ways that the information we have, including with respect to our partners, um, can be shared and put to good use for, with respect to the imperative of justice. Thank you very much. Yep. And just to your and next, there's another question just down to your left. Thanks for your presentation, Ambassador. Um, my question relates to the International Criminal Tribunal and the former Yugoslavia, and if there are any precedent and learnings from that, given that there was some broad similarities against Tyrant, Milosevic um, invading another jurisdiction. And apologies if I missed some of your references earlier as I came in a bit later. So just interested, as I said, in any um, learnings, if there are things that could be replicated and why that worked and the outcomes to what we're facing now with Ukraine. Yeah, thank you. It's a, it's really a great question. And I, I know that many of the current prosecutors are going back and rereading some of that jurisprudence um, from the ICTY era. You know, I, as I mentioned to the student, students earlier today, we had Nuremberg and Tokyo, right, which were in many respects the dawn of the field of international criminal justice. And most issues were issues of first impression then. We did have some kind of now ancient laws of war treaties that envisioned potentially enforcement through war crimes prosecutions, but not very well developed, not a sort of detailed list of crimes with elements, et cetera. Um, there was no notion really of crimes against humanity. That term had been used in the World War I period with respect to violence against the Armenian population um, within the Ottoman Empire. And the concept of genocide was just being conceptualized by Raphael Lemkin, and if, if you attended the uh, Crawford oration several years ago, you would have heard Philippe Sands, and I can recommend his book, East West Street, which tells this remarkable story of two Polish jurists in Lviv, one working on crimes against humanity and one working on the concept of genocide and how there's no actual proof that they met, but like we have to imagine them having a beer together at some point, like young people in a college town as, as they do. So it's, it's really a terrific book to think about how those concepts were conceptualized and now how they are being used on a regular basis in courts around the world. So when we then, as an international community, revived the promise of Nuremberg with the establishment of the ICTY and then a year later the, the Rwanda Tribunal that actually shared a prosecutorial office and shared an appellate chamber which I thought was quite a clever way of ensuring some measure of, you know, to, to sort of work against fragmentation and some measure of coherence in the way in which the law developed, even though those crime bases were quite different, right? We had somewhat of a, an internal armed conflict within Rwanda, but really that situation was marked by a genocide against um, the civilian population. By contrast, in the former Yugoslavia, you had the dissolution of a state, the emergence of new states, and really complicated questions of conflict classification. So in the state of Bosnia itself, once Bosnia declared its independence, and that was recognized as such by the international community, when the rump Yugoslavia continued to battle to retain control over Serbian, particularly areas within the former Yugoslavia, that was an international armed conflict, but you had individuals of Serbian ethnicity who were aligned with neighboring Serbia committing atrocities and committing, uh, participating in an, in an internal armed conflict within Bosnia itself. So part of what we spent a lot of time working on as prosecutors in those early days of the ICTY was the question of conflict classification. 
we don't have to worry about that here, right? This is an old school international armed conflict. We are right within the Geneva Conventions. That mattered before the ICTY because we had two provisions to charge war crimes, a provision involving grave breaches, which required as a predicate element proof that that was an international armed conflict, and then this other very open-ended provision of violations of laws and customs of war that was silent as to the conflict classification. And so what we did as prosecutors, and you know what my bosses did essentially, I was a baby prosecutor at the time, but they charged concurrently under both of those provisions, in part because like we didn't really know what this conflict was and we knew that would have to be an, an element of proof. What the tribunal ultimately did was essentially identify a number of war crimes that were prosecutable under customary international law, even within a non-international armed conflict. So by the time the ICTY finished its work, the question of conflict classification that had been so central to those earlier cases just dissipated. And it didn't really matter what you charged because you charge virtually the same crimes. So in this respect, this is a much easier case, right? We just rely upon the grave breaches and we prosecute those grave breaches as it was envisioned that we would do by the architects of the, of the Geneva Conventions. Where things have gotten new and different, I think, is with respect to the nature and sources of proof and the emergence of digital artifacts of war crimes and crimes against humanity. We didn't really have that at the ICTY. We did have satellite imagery, and the United States was quite helpful in sharing imagery with the prosecutors in order to identify the movement of persons, mass graves, the disruption of mass graves, the cover-up that was happening, and you know whatever else one can see from the sky. And we, we have that now here in, in Ukraine as well, but in Ukraine, Every human being is a documentarian. Why? Because they've got a smartphone, right? And they're just taking in real time video of events that are happening around them. That video can be easily tampered with and changed. We've seen that. We have shallow fakes, we have deep fakes, and our, our detection tools have not kept up with the ability to manipulate digital artifacts. So that is the real challenge, sifting through all of that digital evidence and identifying the best evidence to prove the elements of the offenses, and then dealing with the problems of dis information, misinformation, which we know, of course, Russia is quite adept at. And the larger problem at a sort of 15,000 foot level is we're in a post-truth world, right? There's a liar's dividend. Any individual can say, oh, that's fake. That's been tampered with. It's not, it's not real. It's not, it's not true. And so that puts the onus then on the party seeking to proffer that evidence to prove that it, it, it is what it purports to be and that it has not been tampered with. And so there's a whole cottage industry now of experts in this field working working with documentarians in order to be able to lock down the metadata, including at the point of capture of that evidence, so that it can be introduced maybe 10 years, five years, four years later before a court of law and a judge will accept and rely upon that evidence and not toss it because we're in a post-truth world. So in that respect, the sources of proof are very different, I think. We had problems at the ICTY with custody over the accused. As Dale acknowledged, it's gonna be really hard here too. I'm I'm sort of like an optimist and I'm one of those people that if it's like one drop of water in a glass, I'm like, oh God, it's half full. Um, so I, I'm optimistic that perpetrators will travel and they will be um, taken into custody and those cases will move forward. But you know, obviously that's gonna be a huge challenge and it was a challenge before the ICTY as well, even with the chapter seven provenance of those tribunals, which theoretically meant that every state was under a charter-based obligation to cooperate with those. Nonetheless, we know that those fugitives were at large you know, for years sometimes before they were finally all painstakingly brought into custody, prosecuted, and then um, you know, serving their sentences. So in some respects, it's an easier matter because we're in a much cleaner, it's a much cleaner crime base in a way. In other cases, it's harder because we just have this new, new types of evidence we have to deal with. Um, fascinating, thank you. Uh, I'm going to build on your last comment that related to custody of the accused. Mm. And a lot of what you were talking about was the prosecution of Russia and Russian nationals, um, mainly I think there relating to the military and armed forces. But as we know, there was also a mercenary group, um, the Wagner group, that, that has been and still is, I understand, operating in Ukraine. We know what's, well, we think we know what's happened to, uh, to Brigosian, but there are still a number of uh, members of, uh, of the Wagner Group who are operating in countries in Africa, in, in Central African Republic and Mali, etc. So I'm wondering whether there is investigation as to the movements 
mm-hmm. of um, people working for the Wagner Group and whether that is being investigated to see if those movements, perhaps to Africa, uh, enables the possibility of prosecution of those individuals. Yeah, thank you. It's it's a really a terrific question and a fascinating issue. I mean, we know that Wagner is a malign force wherever it operates, and we've seen that. I, I saw them in the Central African Republic, guys on riding in technicals with balaclavas in the heat. Um, it was pretty obvious, you know, who who they were there for. Um, Mali, Libya, Syria, we've seen Wagner forces in these areas, and they're often associated with abuses as well. And we are also seeing the movement of individuals, individuals who were one place uh, have also been deployed elsewhere. Now this organization, as we assume, ha- no, is leaderless, right? Um, and, you know, what does that say about the risks and the insecurities that Wagner's now being you know, more of a, um, you know, maybe gives it more flexible, more flexibility, more autonomy. They're being picked up by other armed groups potentially. So it's really a a situation of uncertainty. Um, You know, from an international criminal law perspective, non-state actors are equally liable under the laws of war and the prohibitions against crimes against humanity as state actors are. So it should not make a difference when it comes to making you know, prosecutorial decisions if in fact there is sufficient evid- evidence against particular individuals. You, you know, what's interesting about you know, thinking about Wagner and the ICC is that Wagner is operating in many countries where the ICC already has existing jurisdiction. Mali, Central African Republic, Libya, no, not Syria, of course, thanks to Russia's veto of the effort in 2014 to refer that matter to the court, um, but now Ukraine as well. And so, you know, could the ICC, could you imagine a sort of cross-regional Wagner-type prosecution? Remains to be seen if the prosecutor decides to pick that up. But, you know, it's a very fruitful area of investigation, and um, people are tracking closely the movement of Wagner individuals, particularly now that we're in this new sort of uncertain world without uh, progression at the top, presumably. So we might have this uh, gentleman here and then on your left and then over to the right. Uh, Thanks, Ambassador, for a great talk. Um, In 13 months, there's going to be an election in the USA Mm -hmm. and um, uh, it's possible that uh, President Trump will be president again. Uh, Given that uh, it appears that uh, his views um, about uh, the illegality of what's happening in Ukraine are... um, uh, really uh, to uh, turn his back on such things, uh, to put it maybe fairly um, uh, blandly. Uh, could you comment on um, other people in positions such as yours associated with such uh, groups as NATO or the EU or, or the OSCE um, who, who may be able to um, keep on with um, the work that you're doing. Of course, they're probably doing it right now. But um, I'd be really interested to know to what extent you're part of a a group uh, of uh, ambassadorial or senior diplomats who are bringing these matters forward and working internationally to try and encourage uh, all countries uh, to um, uh, take these matters seriously. Are you asking if I'm part of the deep state? Um, no, well, obviously I can't speculate about the election um, as a civil servant, and we are nonpartisan, uh, although I'm a political appointee, of course, to this administration. But I, I think what you're seeing in the United States is really strong bipartisan support for Ukraine and for United States and for multilateral support for Ukraine, um, not only because our closest allies you know, are em- embracing Ukraine as a future aspirant to the European Union, already a member of the Council of Europe, that European orientation is clearly where the Ukrainian people want to be, and that's what they have been fighting for since you know, the Maidan protests, um, which um, you know, back in the day, 2013, et cetera. Um, and I think the American people and I think, you know, peace-loving people around the world are, are very supportive. So I, I don't see that necessarily waning, but it is incredibly important that we maintain unity here. Um, and I think, you know, we, we've seen that across the board, that we, we need to, we are always stronger when we work with our partners. Um, and Australia, of course, is one of our closest allies as well. And I know from my meetings this week that Australia is, is you know, in it for the long term when it comes to Ukraine's future and its independence, its, its independence and its, um, you know, European or, and, and Western orientation. So um, I'm hopeful that not much will change, um, but of course, you know, everything is open to speculation. Uh, yes, my, yeah. my question is, uh, 
relates to the fact that the US is not a, uh, a party to the Rome Convention on the International Criminal Court. Mm -hmm. So my question is how does that affect your and other operatives in the US uh, role in, mm -hmm. in pursuing the sorts of things uh, you, you've talked about before the court? Uh, how does that affect uh, your moral authority to do it? and uh, your practical authority, given that the US is not uh, a party to the International Criminal Court, but in your lecture you were relying on uh, action before the International Criminal Court to deal with the, some of the issues, at least, that have arisen in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, indeed, I, the view of the United States now is that the ICC operates an important and is situated within an important place within a larger ecosystem of international justice. And there will always be important circumstances in which we may only have the ICC, or at a minimum, it will play a role alongside other courts. So, courts where the the nat or situations where the national courts are either unavailable or unwilling to move forward on justice, that's an appropriate time for the International Criminal Court to operate. Ukraine is an interesting situation because, of course, those courts are open and they are willing, and yet they're overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the crimes that they're facing. And so it's, a, in a way, a new model of, of complementarity, which is really a foundational pillar for the Rome statute system, that the court should only step in in the event that the national court is unable or unwilling to, to be in the lead, which would be its natural obligation as a, a deliverer of justice. So notwithstanding that we're not members, we have historically over the years been able to provide very concrete assistance to the ICC um, in a number of different situations. So I think the most um, you know, maybe extreme is the wrong word, but dramatic example is, is two individuals who came within our custody who had been indicted by the ICC and were facing charges for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Bosco Ntaganda, who was fleeing a, a conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo, showed up at the U.S. Embassy in Kigali. We helped to enable bring him to The Hague, where he ultimately stood trial for war crimes, crimes against humanity, including sexual violence. Likewise, Dominic Anguin, who had escaped the Lord's Resistance Army, but was a longtime deputy of Joseph Coney also fell within U.S. custody and was rendered to The Hague, where he, too, was convicted of war crimes, crimes against humanity. So that's at one end. We can also provide information support, diplomatic support. I attend the assemblies, you know, we attend, the government attends the assemblies of states' parties as an observer. We have participated actively in a number of side events and plenary events. The, we always give a, uh, an intervention at that meeting. So there's many ways that even as a non-party, I think we can support the institution. Uh, there's a famous quote. Um, about the United States approach towards international institutions. And that is that we are not necessarily a pillar or a column on the inside, but we're rather a buttress. We're often outside the system because we have a tendency not to ratify treaties that offer some measure of international scrutiny of US actions. At the same time, we are supportive of the system. And so that's where we've landed with respect to the International Criminal Court as well. And, and my job in this office is to be the point of contact for various requests for assistance that come in. We have a legal um, cut that we make. We have a, a statute that governs our relationship with the court. And so we, our Department of Justice conducts a legal analysis. And then we have a policy decision as to whether or not we, are in a, we want to be able to provide the type of assistance that's be at, been asked. And then we have a sort of practical question of like, do we have something to be helpful? Like, can we be helpful here? And sometimes the answer is no, and sometimes the answer is yes. But the default is that we look for ways to be helpful when the court is adjudicating the most serious crimes known to humankind. Um, thank you, um, Ambassador, for your very learned um, approach to this. And I'll just follow up from the question of the previous um, person. And thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Where is the US with respect to ratifying some of these international conventions? We've heard a lot over time, in particular uh, whilst this conflict is going on in the Ukraine, between Ukraine and Russia, and we've heard much about the steps the US is taking to assist mm -hmm. Ukraine, but we've heard little from the US about ratifying some of these international mm -hmm. conventions. I suppose the long and short of my question is, where are we at <laughs> with respect to the US ratifying these conventions, clearly and bluntly? Thank you. Yeah, so as you know, we have a hard time ratifying treaties. Um, we are the only state that has not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the only state. Um, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which is 
basically based directly on the Persons with Dis the Americans with Disabilities Act. So that, you know we're in immediate compliance with that. Um, additional Protocol One, which has been referred for ratification, but it has not yet happened. Um, and the, of course, the Rome Statute, which has you know referred to not yet referred for ratification, but we have signed that. Um, treaty on one of the last days where that was possible. So we have a very high bar in order to ratify treaties, and our Senate is just not at the place where it has made that a priority necessarily. And, and some of these treaties that I've, I've ticked through, and of course the Law of the Sea is another one. These are not just human rights treaties. There's other whole range of treaties that we don't necessarily join. Um, nonetheless, we often try to bring ourselves into compliance with those treaties and our, in our national system. So we often invoke the Law of the Sea Treaty, even though we're not a member of it, because we do think that its provisions are reflective of customary international law and in many respects will advance US interests in places like the Arctic and elsewhere. Um, but we, you know, ultimately we're dependent on the Senate making the decision that it's a priority to join one of these multilateral arrangements. Um, and, and in many cases, they just have not done so, and often with very slim margins, unfortunately, um, that those treaties have not moved forward. So, you know, it, it will remain to the president to determine whether he wants to reinitiate re some of these treaty ratification questions, and, and then for the Senate to decide whether it not, wants to move forward with ratification. So there is some light at the end of the tunnel, is what you're saying? Oh God, I just did say I was a huge optimist, didn't I? And now here I am being asked if there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I, I would love, yes. I hope that someday we will ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We should. We are the only state that has not ratified that treaty. Thank you, Ambassador. Marianne Clarkin, Barrister, Victorian Bar. I just have a very quick question piggybacking on the last two questions. And from my observations from the talk today, and also what's been said. And it's not an original concept. However, are the US really the world's police? Of course not. Of course not. We always are looking for ways to work in partnership with allies, building coalition. Um, not at all. We, we hope that international institutions can take the lead here, and we assume that there will be a, a division of labor and a, a sharing of burdens around the world in order to, to you know, adjudicate international crimes when individuals fall within the, the custody or the jurisdictional reach of particular states. Um, we will play our part. We have our own, as I mentioned, war crimes unit, so we'll be the police when we're able to assert jurisdiction over particular individuals. Um, and we have a few cases moving forward now in, in courts. We had, of course, the Chucky Taylor case. The son of Charles Taylor was the first case that we brought under our torture convention. He was present in the United States and actually was a US citizen by virtue of, um, I think, by virtue of having been born in the United States, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, a second case recently proceeded under our torture statute involving an American citizen who was torturing individuals as part of a kind of weapons arrangement in Iraq. And then we have a third case moving forward with respect to a Gambian um, jungler, one of the Jame's junglers who had, was part of a, essentially a death and tor torture squad within the Gambia. But all of these cases have a nexus to the United States in some respect. So we're not out there seeking the extradition across the world of individuals, but yet focusing on those cases that have some connection to the United States. And I think the hope is that states around the world will undertake those obligations in the same way and that collectively we, be, we will be able to raise the bar of justice around the world and, and provide victims with some sort of a forum in which to give testimony and to see justice being done for the horrific crimes that they've experienced. Uh, you were previously talking on the point of the post-truth world and the dangers mm -hmm. uh, that's coming with that. And well, you did say there were definitive benefits of the uh, frequency of mobile devices and the ability to capture own evidence of such crimes. Do you believe there is a fairly substantial fear of misinformation being spread on both sides and through that are uh, false accusations of mm -hmm. such serious crimes as you were talking about, like war crimes in a sense, for uh, either side and through that the pol politicization of such horrific events? Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely a very high risk. Um, I don't know that we've seen it yet. We have had a few cases move forward in various courts where digital evidence has been central to those cases. And judges have been actually quite adept at accepting that into evidence, evaluating the probity of that evidence, and then you know making reaching whatever conclusions they have reached. Um, that said, I think you know we're going to increasingly see efforts to manipulate digital information. Now, I'm I'm less worried, honestly, about those sorts of mis and disinformation infecting 
a criminal process because those are quite long processes, right? There's an investigation phase, there's a prosecution phase. It always moves slower than we would like these efforts to move. And, and it's partly to be careful, right? These are, there are due process concerns involved. So I would like to believe that we would root out fakes that might be within evidence um, before they would be presented to a judge. It's maybe war, more worrisome when I put on my atrocities prevention hat and you imagine uh, a piece of misinformation that goes viral in the run-up to an election, right? Where So the, the post-election violence in Kenya in 2007 and 8, which gave rise to an investigation before the ICC, there was all kinds of rumors that the election was being stolen, that ballot boxes were showing up by the side of the road, that fights had broken out, et cetera. And none of this proved to be true, but I forget the quote, but you know, the truth, the lie has gone five times around the world before the truth gets its pants on or whatever it happens to be. Point being, you know, that kind of spark for what might be communal violence has me more concerned than some piece of evidence that might be a fake, because I think we would detect it and we would know that if it's crucial to a prosecution to give it the sort of forensic analysis it needs. Um, I just want to emphasize that with all this talk about open source investigations and digital evidence, I still think witnesses are going to be incredibly crucial to prosecutions to be able to tell their story, to be able to contextualize what's happening, um, and, and ultimately maybe to be able to identify responsible individuals. And witness protection has become a, a pretty big priority of my office because witnesses are really the soft underbelly of international criminal justice. We have seen a number of cases fail, including the Kenya cases, as I mentioned, where witnesses have been under assault. They have been intimidated, they have disappeared, they have changed their testimony, potentially in the face of intimidation and efforts to tamper with them. And so, you know, we need to have a, a more fulsome system of international witness protection. And part of the reason I'm in the region is that I attended last week a meeting of the Europol Witness Protection Network. These are prosecutors and investigators that do witness protection in transnational criminal contexts. So counterterrorism, counter narcotics, um, trafficking of persons. And I was there in part to learn about how these systems work with respect to these transnational crimes and looking for ideas that we could adapt to the system of international justice, which is much more rudimentary when it comes to witness protection issues. So to answer your question, I do think it's a real risk, maybe less so at the time of trial, more so at the time of during an investigation. And I'm super worried when it comes to being a risk factor for um, fomenting violence. Um, my impression is that a lot of Russian soldiers uh, are conscripts that don't necessarily want to be there. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that your efforts might prevent some of them from surrendering? And uh, mm. if so, are there ways that you can manage that? That's interesting. Um, I don't know. I mean, obviously, one hopes that the law exerts a deterrent effect. And we know if there are criminologists in the audience that that's very difficult to prove in a national context and you know, even more so maybe in an international context. Are individuals deterred by the law? What the research shows domestically is that it's the certainty of punishment, not necessarily the severity of punishment, that exerts a deterrent effect. And international criminal justice is still in its infancy as a field, of course. There isn't necessarily a guarantee that you will be caught and ultimately prosecuted for committing international crimes. And so we may be in a situation where deterrence is still more of an aspiration than it is an actual real effect. Um, all that said, I, I do think it does exert a deterrence, particularly with respect to individuals who may be thinking to themselves, do I want to continue to be associated with this particular fighting force when I've seen the way in which it's either been ordered to commit abuses or it's not being supervised appropriate and abuses are happening at a more local level or where there's command responsibility and, and the commanders are, are turning a blind eye essentially and enabling abuses to happen where we've seen fighting forces that are essentially being paid through looting, pillage, rape, and et cetera, right? That's how they're paid. Take, take whatever you want. You know, I'm going to look the other way. Um, and so, you know, Obviously, we, we are creating a system where we want there to be a reasonable expectation that you will face consequences in the event that you commit abuses. That said, there's prosecutorial discretion. And so if individuals come forward and are willing to give testimony and turn against their confederates, then you can imagine a situation where they could be become witnesses essentially for the prosecution um, and then participate in the justice process that way, especially if they're feeling reticence about what they're seeing happening around them with respect to their confederates. And so um, I don't think we can assume, it's not clear what 
the prospects of justice are doing with respect to how uh, young, you know, uh, undertrained, undersupervised conscript is, is thinking. Um, and I think that's really a question for the Ukrainians to determine how they want to deal with individuals who may come forward and be willing to surrender and then potentially even offer evidence um, in, a tr in a criminal trial. Thank you. Well, colleagues and guests, as we draw this evening's James Crawford oration to a close, it is my pr privilege to extend our thanks to those who have made today's event possible. First and foremost, um, thank you very much to our distinguished speaker, Ambassador Dr. Beth Van Schack. Your oration was not only thought-provoking, but also a testament to your um, deep knowledge of this area, um, your exploration of the pathways to justice and some of the steps that are being taken now and that can be taken in the future, as well as some of the um, challenges that will be faced as those pathways are followed was, was really um, thought provoking. Your lecture has um, been a stimulating evening and it's certainly a highlight of this, which is the celebrate, part of the celebration of our 140th anniversary year. I'd also like to extend our thanks to Professor Stevens um, for not only his support for the event, but also for his um, commentary um, in response um, to the issues that were raised by the Ambassador. A special thanks also to Professor Matthew Stubbs, who unfortunately hasn't been able to be here with us in person, but who is online. Um, he certainly was instrumental um, in making tonight happen, in inviting the Ambassador and for making sure everything ran smoothly. Uh, but also our, our gratitude to the support team who have really been the um, machinery uh, behind everything tonight. So um, our law school staff, Julia Avdiva, Justine Donzens, Anita Gayen, and um, faculty staff, Bethany Ottaway, whose, tirely efforts, whose tireless efforts have um, really made sure that everything has run smoothly tonight. Uh, once again, thank you all for being with us this evening. Thank you for your thought-provoking questions um, across a wide range of issues. Um, I hope that you have found tonight's um, oration um, as interesting as I have. Please join with me in thanking the Ambassador. Thank you.